Thank you, everyone. Well, I'd like to congratulate you all on making a very wise choice because you've chosen correctly. Anti-aging medicine is, in fact, the future of health care, and you, as the leaders of the future of health care, should have a br very bright future indeed. How many people here... Uh, how many people here are here for the first time? Was the first AFRM conference you've been to? Hold your hands up. Thank you very much. That's great. Well, smart move. Now, anti-aging medicine, just in case, uh, in case any of you have any question whatsoever, uh, anti-aging medicine is simply a euphemism for advanced preventive medicine. So it absolutely astounds me how anyone could have a problem with that. I mean, what's wrong with the early detection, prevention, treatment, and or reversal of aging-related disease? If there is, if you'd meet with me at the end of, the, of my presentation, I'd really appreciate knowing what, what that is. And so if there's any controversy at all, and I think I've heard it all because I'm the guy who coined the term anti-aging medicine, and when we got started in 1992 with just 12 physicians, anti-aging medicine was just, you know, was just A-OK. -okay. And it wasn't until about 1996 when the academy started really rolling and there started to be sizable numbers of physicians and a lot of media attached to anti-aging medicine that there was any controversy at all with the whole idea. I mean, again, what could be wrong with the early detection, prevention, treatment, and or reversal of, of, of degenerative diseases of aging? Well, no one's ever answered that question for me adequately, and I suggest that there is no controversy, that any controversy that might be out there is totally and completely uh, synthetic, is totally and completely made up, and really has nothing to do uh, with, with the reality um, of health care. That that's really all we do in, in, in medicine, and all we've ever done in medicine is anti-aging medicine. I mean, there is very little that you can think of that uh, you're involved in the practice of, which is not, in, uh, which is not associated with uh, early detection, prevention, treatment. And, um, you know, I was, uh, I, was, I was taken aback because I said, you know, everybody's in, in a previous lecture, I said everybody's involved in anti-aging medicine, uh, except for perhaps pathologists and pediatricians. And after I was done with that lecture, four pediatricians in the room came up to me and they were very gruff and they said, hey, what are you talking about? That's all we do in pediatrics is prevention. We're the first preventive medicine doctors. And I had to scratch my head and I said, you know, I apologize, you're absolutely right. Now, this is, um, you know, not to belabor the point, but uh, anti-aging medicine is really an established part of, of, of medical care. It always has been, and uh, it certainly is becoming more and more uh, part of the mainstream today. And this is a, an ad that uh, was in a recent issue of New Scientist. And what they're trying to say quite clearly is, is that life expectancy really has no innate a limitation to it, that we can push life expectancy as far as science and technology will permit, and there are some people who are predicting life expectancies far beyond the norm uh, of what they are today. Today in the United States, life expectancy being 77 years of age, but realize that in the year 1900, life expectancy was uh, only 47 years of age, and at that time, America had the, the highest life expectancy on the planet. Now. This I find kind of interesting. MSNBC did a, a, a story just a, a few days ago, and they're talking about mainstream doctors, essentially you, <laughs> joining the anti-aging bandwagon. Well, again, I say that any, any controversy is synthetic. It doesn't really hold water because uh, anti-aging medicine, simply being a euphemism for anti-aging medicine, is really what it's all about. And it's where the money is, and it's where the future is, and it's where uh, you know, we're going to get the greatest bang for our buck from health care, and it's where we're going to be able to make some real significant improvements into the future. Now, if we look at uh, demographics around the world, uh, it's pretty surprising to me that America, the United States, which spends by far the most, $6,100 per head for every citizen on health care, gets the least bang for their buck than any country on the planet. We're number 47 with a life expectancy of 78.14 years of age. We're just behind number 46, Cyprus, which spends a grand total of $992 per person on health care as far as life expectancy. 
what I think is truly amazing is, is if you look at the rest of the planet, they're spending, they're spending a th- uh, large countries, uh, first world countries, are spending uh, a third to half as much as the U.S., and they're outperforming us in almost all measures of public health and in all measures of, uh, of l- longevity. Andorra, I do not know what they're doing in Andorra. It's a very small country close to Switzerland and uh, on the border of uh, Switzerland, France, and Spain. Uh, a wonderful little country. I hope to visit there one day soon. And uh, their life expectancy is 83.53 years of age. Now, what on earth are they doing that nobody else seems to be doing? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. I know that they do have free postal services for their uh, for their residents. So maybe they're all sending each other's other nice little Christmas cards and greeting cards, and that makes them feel better and makes them live longer. I don't know. But whatever they're doing, they're doing it right. And uh, I'll report back once I have a chance to go visit. The U.S. health care budget is, in, is immense. We're spending something like $2.4 trillion in 2008. Uh, in 2007, it was $2.2 trillion. In um, 2004, it was $1.6 trillion. And it's expected to grow. And this, is, and this is probably an underestimate because it comes from the government, and government statistics are notoriously wrong. But uh, the, uh, it's projected to grow uh, to a level of um, of, uh, two th- of, four th- of uh, $4.3 trillion by 2017, at which time it will uh, absorb almost 20% of the U.S. Health, uh, US gross, gross domestic product. Now, that's an insane figure, 20% of the health care budget or 20% of the gross domestic product and gross domestic budget of the United States. What are we buying with that money? Are we, buying, are we truly buying health care, or are we instead buying disease care? That's really quite a question that must be asked and answered by someone, and we need to hold someone responsible for it, if not at least our, ourselves. Now, what is available to us right here and now, what's easily available to us? If we were to demand that, uh, that easily available uh, preventive me- measures are applied to the general populace, we could save over 100,000 lives every year simply by the use of daily aspirin for reducing cardiovascular risk, smoking cessation, uh, and colorectal screening, of, uh, colorectal screening for cancer. Now, influenza vaccine, I'm not sure that I agree with that. Breast cancer screening in the last two years of life, there might be some benefit to that, but not a lot, not a lot as compared with the others. But there are easily available early diagnostic and early uh, interventions that are available that could save significant numbers of lives. We're not applying these. Our health care system is not applying these. Our government is not applying these. And you have to ask yourself, why aren't they? Why are trillions easily spent for war, okay, and for destruction, but for health care and for public health and for prevention and for protection of our ecology and our environment, it's so hard to find any support for that today.